I want to be a producer with a hit show on Broadway. I want to be a producer. Hey guys, it's Ken. Before we get to this week's podcast, I wanted to remind you about this beautiful little show I'm producing this fall called Daddy Long Legs by the director of a little show you might have heard of called Les Mis, John Caird, and Paul Gordon, who wrote the beautiful Jane Eyre, which was on Broadway a number of years ago. You got to come check it out. And hey, here's a little secret. At the end of this podcast, as a little Easter egg for you, I'm going to play one of the songs from the show, The Secret of Happiness sung by one of the most talented ladies in the city, Megan McGinnis. So hang on to the end of the podcast and listen to the song from Daddy Long Legs. Okay, now on with the show. Hello, Producers Perspective podcast listeners. I am Ken Davenport. We are going to have some fun today. Yes, yes. Hal Prince once said to me, Kid, okay, he didn't say kid, but he did say, Ken, if you want a show to happen, get me to direct it. And what he was telling me was that if you get an A-list Broadway director, the money will come, the theater will come, everything will come, these shows will happen. And today, guess what? We have one of those Broadway A-list directors on this podcast. I'm sitting here across the table with Tony Award winner and occasional golfer, John Rando. Welcome, John. Thank you for, thank you, thank you for that introduction. Yes. John made his directorial debut back in 2000 with a terrific production of The Dinner Party, but he really burst onto the scene with the very uniquely titled You're in Town, which won him that uh, aforementioned Tony. Uh, After that, he went on to direct shows like The Wedding Singer or Christmas Story on the Town, which got another Tony nomination for him. Uh, And just a few weeks ago, he opened Penn & Teller on Broadway to rave reviews, and I just tweeted that it recouped its investment today, so that's That's good news. It's it's very good news. I did not know that. I have a lot of happy producers. Yes, you do. I hope you are happy over in the Frankel office. I hope you got a nice recoupment bonus. (laughs) I I, I, I don't know. I'm open. (laughs) I think you do. Uh, I know your agent well. I have a feeling feeling you do. Um, And actually, um, I know his agent well because John is attached to a very exciting project called Getting the Band Back Together that some guy named Ken Davenport is bringing to Broadway. So, John, let's... uh, Yes, yes. Ken Davenport is bringing that to Broadway. Thank you, Ken Davenport, wherever you are. As soon as we get a theater. <laughs> so, John, take us back. When did you get bit by the theater bug? How did this all happen? Oh, um, well, yes. That's a good question because it was started as a, as a junior high school kid who um, heard that the speech class in seventh grade would be a lot of fun and might be pretty easy. So I took that speech class, and um, we did a lot of improv, and it was a lot of fun. And I became a sort of a actor, and um, acted a lot in junior high school and in high school. And so that's that's when the theater bug bit. However, I didn't show any signs of swelling or anything like that outwardly because I kept telling my parents that I was going to go to law school. And I, I didn't do that. I didn't go to law school. <laughs> I stayed in the theater. But I did study. So anyway, that's and how it happened. Why not law school? Well, I, wanted, I really wanted to be a director. I, in high school, I really started to... Um, I, I had a great drama teacher. Uh, Robert Judd was his name at Clear Creek High in Houston, Texas. Uh, League City, Texas, to be specific. Anyway... Um, and I did a lot of plays with, or in, in his stead and, and working with him. And, and when I went to college, I recognized that I, that's what I really wanted to do. And so at the University of Texas at Austin, where I went to school, I um, kind of devised my own degree plan in, in I, under the humanities label. And I wrote to the university and said, I really want to get a humanities degree, but I want to become a director. And I figured this is how I can do it. I can study languages and Shakespeare and history and um, uh, philosophy and maybe take a few theater classes too. But I didn't want to get a degree from the theater department. UT has this brilliant theater department, but I thought I needed to have a, a few more, you know, thoughts in my head. <laughs> so uh, um, that's how I did it. That's how I did it. So after, after um, college, um, I was faced with this dilemma and so, uh, what should I? Well, how can I do so? I got a Fulbright fellowship to study 
theater in Europe, in Germany and Italy. And um, so I did. I went there. And then I came back. And then it was like I had to really face the music and decide, am I going to do this for a career? And so at that point, I applied for graduate work at, to UCLA in theater directing. And I also applied to Columbia School of International Relations, thinking that if the theater thing didn't go well, maybe I could get into this school <laughs> and do some international relating. Because <laughs> I spoke German and Italian, and I was, and um, so in the mail from Columbia, I got a very thin envelope, and it opened it up, and of course it was a rejection letter. But from UCLA, I got a like a round trip ticket, airplane ticket. Come and see us. Come meet us. We're really interested in talking to you. We really think you have something. And so I went to UCLA and studied theater, theater and got my MFA in directing. So you, just back to undergrad for a second, you designed your own major. Yes. It sounds like that. Which, yeah. for those of you, this is a real theme developing in a lot of the artists that I talk to, like yourself, uh, who have gone on to very successful careers. Teresa Rebeck, in last week's podcast, spoke about how she did the same thing, basically. She wow. convinced them to have a playwriting class, um, which I find fascinating. So you got this undergraduate degree that you designed yourself, and then you got your MFA in directing. But the seed for directing was planted in high school, you said? Yeah, high school. The first play I directed was called, uh, it was my senior year, it was called The Butler Did It. And it was a kind of lousy version of, of a mystery comedy play. I smell a revival. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think it ever lived. <laughs> but it was very funny for a, for a high school play. You know, and of course there was no butler in the play. There was a maid, and the maid did the did the murder. Um, so but, what, but what was it about directing? You know, as, as high school students, most people want to be on the stage so yeah. they can show off to all their friends. What was it about directing that was very attractive to you and that still is attractive to you? Guys? I love the craft of acting, and I, I find it as a director. I love actors. I love watching and working and trying to help solve the mystery of the scene, of the, of the language, of the moment. So that's what I'm really into. So... Um, and that's what I was into. So at that time, and as I got, as I went through college and into grad school, I started to realize what I really liked was the whole picture. I didn't just like, as an actor, because I had a choice not to be an actor and not to try to be an actor. And I acted all through college and, in, and into grad school, but then I stopped after that. I never acted professionally. And uh, I just wasn't that interested in my body. I wasn't that interested in my voice. And all of that stuff that actors have to be interested in, my own sort of weird psychology. And I, I was more interested in the literature and the storytelling and, and what these stories can do to an audience and how an, an actor and, and working with text can transform himself or herself. And that, those are the kind of things that just I was attracted to. So tell us about the path of You're in Town and how You're in Town happened. Yeah, that was, You're in Town, um, I got a phone call from the from these very young guys who were becoming producers, and, um, Matthew Rigo at the Araka Group, the great Araka Group. Um, at that time, they were just starting out, and Matthew I met at the uh, Berkshire Theater Festival because he uh, and I were working together there as young uh, directors. And he called me and said, hey, I got a really cool play that I think you'd like. It's a musical. I think you'd like to do it. And that, he wanted me to come and see it. It was happening at the Fringe Festival, another the first production of it. And I couldn't go. So uh, he sent me the script, and uh, I read the script uh, without listening to the music. I called him up and said, this is brilliant. I want to do it. And then he said, did you hear the music? I said, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> but I found that to be a very good help in picking musicals. You really do have to read them and understand the story and the through line and make sure you like it and want to tell that story first. Um, because music is so seductive. It's just, like, amazingly seductive. So anyway, that's that's how that happened. And then, you know, it was just like this great, very, very deliberate, focused journey of how to get that that show to, to the ultimate goal of being on Broadway. And we did it through a couple of readings, some development readings, and then a, then a fantastic off-Broadway um, production um, on 54, on this very street, just a, a half a block from here. At a police station. One of my favorite crappy off, uh, off Broadway theaters above a courthouse. Venues, yes. Yeah. It, above a courthouse is a police station. It was. And part of that 
inspired us to do the design. We just wanted to, so we just basically saw that they had like this white tile, and we said, okay, let's, in the hall, and said, hey, that'll be great for our set. We'll put that in our set. And we just kind of created that space to make it feel like it was really um, there, like you were in it. So anyway, that's how that's how your intent happened, and we were you know, really fortunate. And it came at a really compelling time in the theater where I think Broadway was changing dramatically, and then 9-11 happened. Four days before we were supposed to open, <laughs> 9-11 happened, and um, it was an amazing moment. Um, and so we we had a delay. In fact, uh, um, we Broadway went dark for a few nights, and when we came back to perform, this is before we opened, we still had our, the opening night cake that we were supposed to eat. So I got when I made a speech before we started, just thanking the audience for actually coming to the theater because you know that that was a pretty scary time, and invited them all to have cake after the show. We had the cake in, right in the lobby there. Once they finished, you know, it was good chocolate cake. <laughs> when that show was done, when you read it, when you were doing it off Broadway, did you think, oh, we could get this to Broadway? This is a Broadway show. Was well, it- the goal was not, the, the, we kept saying, we need to be a thorn in Broadway's side. That's sort of what I kind of kept telling people. So we need to be a thorn in Broadway's side. We need to be such a problem child that they don't know what to do, so they have to put us there. And so we created it. We create. We created. The, 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 there, there was no place for that show actually to be financially, commercially successful because of the size of it off Broadway. It really couldn't. Off Broadway couldn't sustain it. We knew that. But we created a production that, if we had to stay off Broadway, we would try to sustain it. The good news is that we did well, and so we could move it to Broadway. And of course, at that time, we picked uh, the Henry Miller Theater, which you know was a five hundred plus seat house, really small house, really dilapidated theater, because it would be perfect for the show. So that's how that that's how that happened. So the goal the goal was always to to be be a, a, a thorn in Broadway's side, to kind of make fun of it at the same time to worship it. Let's go back to this idea which I find fascinating about picking a musical or picking a script that um, that you want to do just by reading it and not listen to the music. Because you're right, music could get you to do a lot of shows. I've seen a lot of shows where music is great, but the shows are not so great. Is that what you do with 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 other musicals? You just read the script first. What are you looking for when you when you do that? Yeah, always, always read first. Unless, of course, it's you know the Carol King musical. Then you, of course, you're going to listen first to you know her stuff or whatever. But most of the time, yes, really, really listen, really listen to the book. Hear what the story is just by reading it to yourself, reading it out loud sometimes. And does it turn me on? Am I excited by it? Does it make me laugh? Does it, does it have a point? What's the point? How can I help? Maybe it's not fully fleshed out yet. I might be able to help it. And then go to the music and see how the music sounds, how it feels. Because music is really seductive. It's just, it can totally influence you and your thinking and your emotion. And you, as a director, you just... Be sure you know what the story is and what the tone of the story might be that you want to tell. And if you can get that first in your head, in my mind, then then listen to the score and and hopefully you're delighted and surprised and amazed. Case, case after case on a on a good in a good reading, in a good reading of a musical, the, the musical seems to read really well. Oftentimes the music does too, just because. You've now been directing on Broadway. You're in your second decade of directing Broadway shows now since the premiere of Dinner Party. Yes. Have the demands on a director changed over the last 20 years? Do you find yourself like, I never had to do this before, or this is a new skill that I've had to acquire? Anything different? I think there's a lot different in terms of, in terms of um, stretching the imagination, because that's what you know we try to do, everybody. Um, I love... I love uh, What's happening? There's so many exciting, interesting um, revivals. So many exciting, interesting new work happening that um, you know that, that the challenges are that you know just artistically. There's some really impressive challenges out there, and make and make you want to do better work, even greater work than what you're seeing. You know, and constantly pushing you, and um, so you feel that. I think the most in- there, Broadway is really different than it was. Um, you know, before 2001, it's dramatically different uh, now. It's dramatically different in the past six years. I mean, you know, it's just the way ticket buyers are behaving is so interesting and 
amazing. And the kind of prices that people are paying for the for what they really have to see, as opposed to what they might like to see. Um, it's really, really compelling. And having, you know, one of the things that I've, that I've, uh, am just kind of pleasantly surprised by, but also intimidated by is the, um, the Broadway culture, uh, there, there's a huge now family market out there. Um, there, there, if you look around and you see the musicals playing, many of them, have to do with they're there and they're healthy because of families going to see them, young people with their parents, and um, so that's a big that's a big interesting part of our journey now is creating not only um, stuff that you know might be compelling and inventive for adults but also the children audience. So you know, having worked on a Christmas story, for example. And rec- seeing the ma- the enthusiasm, the family enthusiasm in the theater, it's really special, um, and it, that that also makes me realize that there's a lot of uh, across America coming to New York City. There are, there's a lot of really great um, young people who who are passionate about the theater, passionate about seeing it, passionate about especially about the musical theater. It seems like musicals in high school and junior high have come such a huge way, especially in the past 15 years, really. I mean, it was always a part of our, part of our, you know, our, our breeding ground, a place for us to create great artists, but now it's even more than ever. And so that part is really fascinating. I don't know if I answered your question, but I wanted to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> you did. You did. Uh, you mentioned revivals there at the yep. beginning of that answer, and this year... Um, you directed on the town, yeah. Your first Broadway musical revival, which I loved and didn't expect to, because I think that revival is a dusty old yeah. revival, yeah. right? And I was not so excited about it. And then now I hear, oh, you're doing it. Of course, we're working together. And I've experienced you working on our show together, uh, which is a new musical, which can go any direction you want. Yeah. And you were so good at poking the creatives dramaturgically to know, make sure the hero is doing this, and what about your lead character here? Yeah. You can't do that so much on a revival, right? So right. the text is the text, especially something like On the Town, yeah. that's yeah. biblical in yeah. almost. How do you approach adding, because the, the On the Town production has such a rando stamp to it. It <laughs> so feels like you and is so unique and different. How do you find that when you can't change the text or the score? Well, you know, I, I'm, I, I've had this great history of learning about the musical theater because I didn't start there. I started in the classical theater. That's really where I trained. That's really what I did. And it wasn't until... I mean, You're in Town was essentially my first musical, (laughs) which was a nice musical to start. Um, But I had this great thing called City Center Encores. um, And the people there, Jack Fertel, um, Kathleen Marshall, who was running it, Walter Bobby, all these wonderful musical theater artists back in 1994. Five or whenever I first started there, ninety six, uh, ninety seven, whenever it was, and um, over the years I developed this great passion for really trying to understand these wonderful old, old musicals that could how to breathe life into them, how to give them, you know, a robust new energy, with at the same time being totally respectful of them, loving their stories and wanting the story to be be told again, knowing that. It, Trusting that, um, so there was always that debate. And with with this particular production on the town, there were there were many things that I thought were really important. One of them was the joy and the and the sex appeal of of New York, of sailors visiting New York and their journey that they make through the town. And I thought and, and I thought it was just a fantastic um, the original uh, the the book and the and the the music. It, it captured this time and this energy, this youthful energy so clearly because, you know, in 1944, we're, we're going off to war, we're, we're 20-something, we arrive in New York, it's New York City, it's one of the great cities, it's amazing, it's our country's, you know, entertainment capital, there's so many beautiful women here, you know, well, let's find, let's find one tonight, and they do, and, they, and each of these three guys find find the girl of their dreams in, in one night. It's such a great story to tell. I, I wanted to, I, I was so passionate about telling that and telling it with humor and, and joy. And yet, you know, it's such a great piece because they have to say goodbye at the end of it. And so 
the 24 hours, when the 24 hours is over, they're saying goodbye, that they may never see these women because they're going off to, to fight a war that's much bigger than, than their little their little journey is. Um, so it, it's a it's a great story. I knew that. I knew that when I was working on it. So um, and I had a really good cast and the great Jasper Gost to to do the choreography. So what kind of writers do you like to work with? So let's flip now to the new musical. How do you approach working with? You read something, you like it, you want to talk to the writers. What? How is that relationship? Or describe your perfect writer director relationship. Um, I love um, working with writers, and I love listening to them, and really hearing them out, and trying to help them tell the story they're 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 eager to get on the page and therefore on the stage. That's the key, I think, in terms of how I work with writers. I love the process, but I also love helping, as opposed to dictating, um, because I, I don't I, I I really try to shy away from that kind of language. Well, they have to say this here, or they have to do this there, and this has to happen. That kind of language would put me off as a director, and you know I have such real respect for writers, and 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 because you know you. You're sitting there hoping they're going to come up with this very funny idea or this great line that's going to make your your job a lot easier, and so you know you're kind of trying to encourage and nurture and and reassure. A lot of times, working with writers is just like that's really good. That's really good. You know, it's it's profound. It's really good. It really it does something. Keep going. That those kind of words are really important. In a musical, especially, the collaboration is so complicated because you're not only dealing, of course, with the book writer, but often you're dealing with the lyricist separate from the book writer and, or as a team, and then you're dealing also with the composer. So helping the, the team create the same idea, the same thought, is really, really a fun job for a director. Um, I love that job. So, you know, uh, I think the other thing, too, is just like... The more familiar, as the years go by, the more familiar I get with musicals and the more I study them and, and know the past musicals as well as what's happening right now, it makes my job easier because it's just, you know, I, I do know that there's some structural things that can really help and that can help tell the story. Or maybe there's some structural pieces missing that need to be need to be there. So I'm able to help the, the, the writers see that. And, um, and then... I think what is the most fascinating, however, thing for a director of a musical and working with writers is, okay, here's a scene you've written, and it is in on a train, and it's a really good scene. It's really good. I get it. The characters are great. Right before that, you have a scene that's in a carousel, and that's a really good scene. But there's nothing to get me from this carousel to this train, and that's a big journey. I, I have some issues. I don't know if I should. How am I going to make the scenery do what it needs to do? How am I going to? How, what? So maybe what we need to do is write a song that that takes us through the carousel into the train and past it, you know, or something like that. I I think that sometimes it's really helpful to take writers sometimes through the questions that I ask about a script as a director in terms of how how the story is unfolding in three dimension on the stage and that helps them write write oh I have a great idea when she gets off the carousel she's going to sing and the world will change behind her and will be will arrive at the, on the train yes <laughs> and that writer writes the best song of the show suddenly you know it doesn't always work like that but you, you know what I'm getting at it's that constructivist uh, thinking that a director can bring that helps uh, a writer continue to develop in a script. One of the favorite exchanges uh, that I've had with you developing getting the band back together was we were talking about... <laughs> oh, God. Here it comes. Yeah. Good, say it. <laughs> we were talking about one of the lead character's love interest, the love interest, the character of Danny. And you were saying, like, well, she just doesn't feel strong enough. We've, we've got to get her to... We've got to get... We've got to... Well... We just have to have a song good enough so Adina Menzel would want to play her. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I looked at you going like, what? And you, you were like, well, isn't that what we want here? And of course, you were talking about the strength of the character yeah. through Adina. But you also said, 
look, we want to attract actresses like Adina Menzel yep. to do our show, which, again, what I love about what you do is you balance so much of the art and some of the commerce. Yeah, yeah. How important is that to a modern-day director? Thank you. That Actually, that's probably... Get, that gets right back to that earlier question in a way. Yes, the the smell of the commercial is really also critical to wrestle with and grapple with as a director. It's very tricky um, because if you don't have, say, you don't, you listen to your producers and they're begging you for a star, but actually you may have already found the right people for it and the producer agrees and then you, we're both scratching our heads, what are we going to do because we don't have a name, but we have this good company. Then you'd look at the project and you say, well, maybe the good news here is instead of 36 people and this star, we'll make it 24 people. So we'll make, maybe we make the cast a little smaller. Maybe we conceive it in a different way visually that helps us lower the initial cost. And I've had countless, I mean, you and I have had conversations about that. It's just like, how do we... It's really, I actually think the th that, that three-way conversation between the writer, director, and producer, so, or the writers, per se, if it's, a, if it's a musical and there are three or four writers on it, that, that, but that triumph of trying to solve the, the whole puzzle, trying to be creative, trying to be inventive, trying to tell an exciting story, at the same time not being obviously commercial and obviously so that you end up with something that feels soft or spongy and not electric. And then also, will, it, will the numbers work? Economically, will this work? How can we keep the show open? That, those kind of questions. I just think that they really influence everything. They influence how you do things, how you design things, how you talk about them. So it's a, it's a great relationship. It's really fun. It's, a, it's why we do our job, I think. So look, you've had a lot of success but you've had some shows that haven't worked out yes. as well. Happily, you've had some duds. <laughs> yes, name one. <laughs> Biggest dud? Biggest dud? Well, Dance of the Vampires, of course. <laughs> of course, Dance of the Vampires, of course. Uh, how do you deal with something like Dance of the Vampires well, when it doesn't work out? Obviously, you get into it thinking, this is... This is well, work. I don't know about that either. <laughs> now we're getting to it. <laughs> well, that, that's, that's actually, if you have a drink, we could talk about Dance of the Vampires. Um, but I, uh, but I wear that badge with great honor and love. And that was a very difficult time in my life because my mother was dying during the previews. It was a real nightmare. It was horrible um, in terms of all the personal stuff that was going on, as well as, as well as trying to trying to make the show work. And so, but your question really is about how to deal with the bumps in the along the way, and it, it's hard. It's hard. It, it's actually really tough. And you know what? I work a lot. Also, I work a lot that's obviously not on Broadway. I do a lot of off-Broadway. I do a lot of regional theater. I really believe in the American regional theater. I think it's so important to the health of what we do. And frankly, a lot of times it's way better than what's happening on Broadway or in New York. Not always, but a lot of times. There's some great stuff out there, and, and um, it's really fun to work out there. So that out there meaning New Jersey, even. The George Street, where we did Getting the Band Back Together, or... Or at Chicago Shakes, I'm about to do the heir apparent and David Ives' play there. So, you know, you just you just go back to work. You know, you just keep working. When I was an assistant director, I remember um, I was an assistant director really, really close to Jack O'Brien. Um, and he was running the, the Old Globe Theater in San Diego at the time. And they do they were doing, they still do, um, they were doing 16 shows a year. And at one point, I remember overhearing a conversation with this brilliant managing director, Tom Hall, and they were they were it was a it was a real honest conversation about about the work, and we were working on a show. It was my first show with Jack that I was assisting, and it was a it was a Terrence McNally play that that bombed that did terrible. It was called Up in Saratoga, and it was a fantastic rewrite, funny funny rewrite of a 19th century American comedy called Saratoga that nobody. Back then, it was a big hit, but nobody knows it now. Um, anyway, I remember Jack turning to Tom Hall, and they were talking about losing and talking about having to you know, deal with the fact that this wasn't going to be success and what have you. He said, you know, it's really hard to do 14 hits a year. You know, we're really lucky to get three hits a year. 
we're really pushing our luck there. So, you know, we do a lot of work and we learn a lot from the plays that we don't do so well. And that's definitely the case. I mean, just, uh, you know, that was like great lesson number one as an assistant director. It's like, okay, you want the professional theater? Here's what you need to know. Three out of 14. Three out of 14, you know. And that's pretty good. That's like baseball averages, you know what I mean? And so as long as you know that, presumably the people who are going to hire you know that as well. <laughs> that doesn't always happen. But, you know, it, sometimes it takes producers a little bit of time to come back to you and to say, you know, maybe he's got it in this on this one or this one that we're doing about to do. So, you know, that's how you do it. Just keep going on. You just keep doing shows. We talked about your relationship with authors, the type of relationship you like to have. What about producers? Do you like when they're actively involved? Do you like them to write a check, sit back? Or how do you like them to be involved with the shows? Yeah, I'm, you know, I've worked with really very, very good producers. And I like a producer who has an opinion and who has focus. But I, what I really love is a producer who actually understands the process and recognizes that sometimes it takes a week and a half to get to where the producer wants the show to be or a scene to be or a song to be that recognizes the whole entire process, understands it, and gives the director the playground and, the, the, and all the equipment in the playground needed to make the joyous event happen, the, the, the charm of a theatrical event happen. So I love producers that understand that. And I want, however, also producers that have opinions, and that can say, you know, don't really like that part of it, and here's why. And I listen, you know. And there are some things that I, I'm willing to go to the mat on, and I want a producer to be able to take, my, when I want to go to the mat on something, to recognize that and say, Randall really likes this. Well, there must be a reason for it. So, you know, and he explained it, and I think I get it. You know, maybe it'll work. But I also will say the same thing about the producer. producer really wants this, so let's try it. Let's see what happens. So I, I love a trusting relationship, an honest relationship. Like when we work together, I, I really love it because you come at me strong at times and I come right back at you with strong. And it's like, Ken's got an idea there. I got to help him. He's right. Damn it. Or, or he's not right at all. He's crazy. But, you know, I, I love being able to be passionate about it and at the same time respectful and honest. I love producers that know how hard it is to do this stuff. <laughs> to know how hard musical theater is. Okay, I'm going to ask a real shocking question. <laughs> a question that I haven't asked anyone else in the 30-something-odd podcast. You ready? Go. Serena Williams, the tennis star, was recently quoted saying this, Tennis is a game, but family is forever. Now, I've met your wife. I hear you talk about your son all the time, a big soccer player, right? Yes, yes. I've seen him. He had an injury last year. You were heartbroken about it because yeah. how he's a big goalie, right? Yeah. Keeper, I should say. Keeper, yeah. What, the question really is this, and you know, I don't think we talk about this enough in this business that can really occupy seven days of your life and every hour, waking minute of the day. How do you balance this obviously very important family life that you have yeah. and the demands of being a in-demand director and having multiple shows go on at the same time yeah. and always having to look for the next show. Before we started this podcast, you were like, I'm thinking about what's next, what's next. Yeah. This may not happen, this might. Yeah. How do you balance your important family and life with all this? Yeah, it's, it's the best question. It's the best question because it's the most important question. Um, when I was very young in high school and acting and Actually, it was the first year of college, and I was sitting on my bed playing my guitar. My mom walks into the room, and she goes, "You know, you're not really, you're not really thinking about doing that theater stuff for your career, are you?" And I said to her, "You know, I just want to do what I love," and that's what happened. I did what I love, and then I recognized that I needed family. It was a really important part of my life. And um, really, actually, more important. Um, so I learned to balance, and I'm still learning how to balance. In fact, right now, I'm thinking 
I want to really want to go see On the Town tonight because I don't get to see it for a couple of weeks, and I I want to see Megan Fairchild who's leading the show. I want to just thank her for her service and what have you. At the same time, I'm really eager to go home and just have dinner with my son and my wife because he's been at practice all week and we haven't had a dinner together. So inside, I'm really wrestling right now, and I'm going to go home and have dinner. And then, then maybe after dinner, once the dishes are done, once everything's cool, then I may slip out and come back to, to, see, to see the show. You make it your priority because um, it keeps you sane, it keeps you focused, and you really care. You really care. And I, in, in bringing up Alex, my son, who's 14 now, he has no interest in the theater whatsoever, which is it's so remarkable. And it's very much like me. I, I had My dad was an aerospace engineer. He helped build the lunar module. And he, that's why we were in Texas. That's what we did down there. He, he was a pretty good aerospace engineer. He went on to help build the, the Skylab and then the space shuttle and then ultimately the space station before he died and retired. And, um, and I loved astronauts and space and all that as a boy but I had really no desire to do it and that's that's my son you know he has no desire to be in the theater and really you know I had to beg him to come see Penn and Teller even of course he totally loves Penn and Teller and he thinks they're the coolest thing on earth now but it's that way you know and um, of course he has no trouble getting me to one of his soccer matches Uh, you know I can stand on the sideline and just totally lose myself and forget about everything that I have to do in the business world and just be a part of my family. And so that really is why you do it, I guess. <laughs> it's, it's not fun. I don't, and I, 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 the one thing that I do tell young directors who ask this question, and they do ask it, how do you, you know, how do you have a family and do this career? And I basically said, I waited too long. Don't you wait so long. Start now. Do it now. That, and I do, I do believe that. I, I actually, in hindsight, realize, oh, you know what? Kids are great. They're going to grow up. You're going to make it. It's going to be okay. You just need to do it. <laughs> so, Okay, last question now. My genie question, we call it. Mm-hmm. I want you to imagine that the genie from Aladdin comes to one of your son's soccer matches and says, John, it's... Halftime. I was going to say intermission there. I almost <laughs> said intermission. Uh, it's halftime. I'm going to I want to talk to you. You've done such great things, and you pay attention to your son's soccer games, even though you got 17 shows running. I want to grant you one wish. One wish only. What is the one thing that drives you so nuts about Broadway, that makes you angry, that could keep you up at night, that could distract you from watching a, your son's soccer game? The one thing that really irritates you that you would ask this genie to wish away or to change with a snap of the finger? What would that one wish be? Um, hmm. I think, uh, hmm, wild, wild question. I guess I wish, oh, I, you know what I think? I, I think I would wish for uh, some more theaters. Some more theaters. I wish New York City would build, if we're talking about Broadway, I wish New York City would build a few more theaters. It's strange, but in the success, the kind of unbelievable success of Broadway, even though some shows open and close and what have you, there's still so many waiting for theaters. And you have these shows that have been running for 20-plus years, and they're so wonderful, or 10 years, or whatever it is, they're so wonderful. But they prevent these other wonderful shows to find their spaces. And so I wish, you know, when we build these big buildings and these big glass towers all around us here in in the theater district, that they required to build a theater, too, in the basement, another cool space to do a musical or a new play. So that's probably what I wish for. I just wish for, um, it's just, it feels like a little too tight. The real estate is just a little too tight. There used to be, as you know, I mean, there used to be, what, 80-plus more theaters back before 1965? It seems to me that maybe times have changed now, and the theater goers could do that. We could afford, you know, 10 more shows a season. The economy seems to be strong, and certainly New York City is such a wonderful tourist destination now. The tourists want to come, and, 
What do they want to do when they come to New York? They want to see the Statue of Liberty, they want to see the Empire State Building, and they want to go to Broadway. And Broadway is on every single list of every tourist. At least one show, if not several. So build us some more theaters, Jeannie. I want to thank John for taking time out of his day and, and wish him well as he goes to have dinner with his family. Uh, and thank you for being here. He's a terrific director. He's a terrific guy. I appreciate you spending your time with us. Thanks to all of you for listening. Uh, I'm not sure who's going to be on next week's podcast, but it'll be someone exciting. Don't you worry. Tune in. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you then. Okay, guys, as promised, here it is. Megan McGinnis singing The Secret of Happiness from Daddy Long Legs. Enjoy. You know, Daddy, it isn't the big troubles in life that require character. Anyone can rise to a crisis and face a crushing tragedy with courage. But to meet the petty hazards of the day with a laugh, I really think that requires spirit. I've discovered the secret of happiness is learning how to glide. I've discovered the secret of happiness is just... See you.